I wanted to get this video up like a week ago, but things kept happening and then I got ill, as you can probably tell, so uh, apologies for the quality of my voice, but I live in Britain where we don't have magic potions, we have Lemsip and it's crap. Why was it that when she heard Granny ramble on about witchcraft, she longed for the cutting magic of wizardry? But whenever she heard Treetle speak in his high-pitched voice, she would fight to the death for witchcraft. She'd be both, or none at all. And the more they intended to stop her, the more she wanted it. She'd be a witch and a wizard too, and she would show them. I've been thinking recently, apropos of absolutely nothing, about the word legacy. How it's a particularly loaded word when it comes to authors, artists, filmmakers, any kind of creative really. A prolific author, unlike the vast majority of us, leaves behind a body of work full of clues as to their real character. Terry Pratchett, for example, who is Britain's best and most beloved author after Tolkien, published a bewildering 41 Discworld novels over a period of 32 years, almost exactly the latter half of his life. If you're currently doing some quick maths and thinking, that's preposterous, that means he must have been writing more than one book a year at one point, then yeah, at the time it was a bit of a running joke. At his most prolific, he was writing over 400 words per day, minimum, with an almost religious determination. Sometimes he would write significantly more. At that rate, you can knock out a novel's worth of words in about six months. The trick is sustaining it. It's astonishing to me, someone who writes a 1200 word script and then has to go and have a lie down for about a week, that he just wrote and wrote and wrote and never stopped. Of course, any idiot can write 400 crap words a day, but Pratchett was knocking out some of the greatest works of satire, fantasy or otherwise, that the English language has ever been moved to produce. For a solid 32 years, that's a ridiculous run. That's a better streak than The Undertaker. See you soon. And yet, I don't think the most important part of his legacy is the burgeoning body of literary works that he left behind, but rather the kindness and thoughtfulness of the man that they often reflect. The Sam Vimes Boots theory of economic unfairness, which has become a bit of a left-wing meme in recent years because it perfectly summarises how capitalism is a prison for the poor. The entirety of Equal Rights, which is, in part, about how generational attitudes, societal rules and institutional bureaucracy can all be damned if they get in the way of someone living their truth. And Snuff, in which the goblins of the Discworld universe, treated with nothing but contempt and cruelty up to this point, get properly fleshed out with a unique culture and religion just in time for their Spartacus moment. Which brings us to Oblivion, a video game that Terry Pratchett absolutely loved, where his experiences with the surprisingly complex nature of goblin tribes as simulated in Oblivion's world inspired the writing of Snuff some years later. His adoration for Oblivion, its world, its complex environments and systems which made sneaking around as a thief an absolute joy is well documented. Of course he would have felt at home here, given its adherence to the fantasy trope of having a big, important school of magic making its home in the capital of the realm. His unseen university would itself be depicted in three video game adaptations of the Discworld universe. But there's something about walking around in the Arcane University in Cyrodiil, or indeed any of its streets and houses, that makes you feel oddly connected to the man, like visiting Hampton Court and keeping Shakespeare in your thoughts. There's something magical in knowing that wherever you stand in the Imperial City, Terry Pratchett would in all likelihood have stood there too. Do compliments get any better than that? You get very be. embarrassed for heaven's sake, because you know when you go home, you just, <laughs> you're just your wife's husband. and. You've got to go and clean out the cat box. Even his love for Oblivion gives us some insight into his characters. He was particularly fond of a popular companion mod known as Vilya, a complex NPC follower designed to have a meaningful relationship with the player in the form of conversation, gift giving, and being generally helpful while questing. Pratchett went out of his way to contact the creators of the mod to give thanks and ended up contributing scripted voice lines to the character, enriching the original work. I can't say that I'm afraid of goblins, but I hate the smell of them. 
The mod was later designed with a feature that would help players navigate their way out of dungeons or onto the next objective, a feature which allowed him to continue enjoying the game even as his Alzheimer's condition made it difficult to navigate complex 3D spaces. The mod is still fondly used to this day, as is its Skyrim-based sequel. If you want to know more about this, the story was beautifully reported by Kian Maher over on Eurogamer some years back. I'll put a link to that article in the description. Pratchett's legacy is entangled with the world of video games in some very profound ways, as well as his documented love of Oblivion and involvement with its modding scene, as well as the three classic point-and-click adventures that are directly adapted from his work. His daughter Rihanna, who is a brilliant writer and a national treasure in her own right, was the lead writer on the Overlord series and the 2013 Tomb Raider reboot, which are both series that I absolutely love. Overlord being a genuinely funny video game which sends up a lot of the genre's fantasy tropes, and Tomb Raider being a work that humanises Lara Croft in a way that I consider to be a very bold and successful female-led change in direction for the series. But above all, I think Hayes is a legacy which can be summed up as kindness. His belief that ultimately everyone should be able to live and die with basic dignity, with their choices and inner truths respected by peers and institutions. His tireless work as a campaigner for the right to die exemplifies this. They say, what about the sanctity of human life? And I say, what about the dignity of human life? There's been a lot of talk in recent days about separating art from artist, death of the author, invoking the concept of no ethical consumption under capitalism, which is meant, by the way, to be a critique of the system and not an all-encompassing license to do whatever the fuck you want. Countless attempts to cast cognitive dissonance as some kind of virtue in an attempt to bypass the thoughtlessness or downright callousness of a choice that some are determined to actively make. And I have some sympathy with those of you who might feel conflicted. I know what it's like to have to let go of something you grew up loving because the creator, as it turns out years later, is a horrible, raging bigot who actively harms people you count among your family and friends. But there are other Mancunian songwriters who were big in the 80s, and there are other fantasy worlds to get lost in, beautiful ones, brilliant ones, frankly better ones. There are other authors whose legacies are built on a foundation of thoughtfulness and generosity of spirit, whose view of the world is plain to divine from the text, who never betrayed the faith and trust that millions of us placed in them. Legacies which are, in a word, untainted, where the mental gymnastics needed to separate art from artists are simply not required. And honestly, they're so much easier to love. Ultimately, there's never been an easier way to show solidarity with a beleaguered minority than simply not spending £70 on a particular product, than simply not sinking dozens and dozens of hours into a particular RPG. It's not a difficult choice. You don't even need to go on a march. It's so passive, so simple. Why go out of your way to contribute to a culture that has put trans people on the front line of a culture war that's been brewing away for decades, that has sucked everything into it and become all-encompassing to the point where our institutions and societies are crumbling because all people seem to care about is whether things are woke or not instead of actually fixing the problems we have as nations, as societies. There's a way to simply not compound that, not contribute to that, and it doesn't cost you anything. Anyway, you can get Oblivion for like a fiver now. It's got a magic school in it. Terry Pratchett loved it, runs at 4K60 on the Series X. You can't go wrong. And you can go very wrong with the other thing, but you can't go wrong with Oblivion. Right, cheers. Uh, I need to go to bed. I've been Jim Tranker for VG247, and you should definitely like and subscribe, because if you don't, you smell. Check out the website, check out the podcast, check it all out. Check it out like it's Supermarket Sweet Man. I'll speak to you later.